Welcome to Resilience Unraveled. Hi everybody and welcome to Resilience Unraveled, a podcast that examines all aspects of personal and organisational resilience. A huge all-encompassing subject that covers the ability to thrive in life by harnessing your cognitive, emotional, physiological and contextual abilities. I share stories from people who have thrived despite remarkable obstacles, as well as highly successful practitioners and experts across a range of topics. And this podcast introduces their amazing stories and expertise, as well as my own reflections, perspectives, strategies and tips, which come from my own synthesis of themes and trends from wider learning. You can go to qedod.com forward slash extras to access offers, tools and resources, including free articles and eBooks. For those of you that would be interested in supporting our work and contributing more proactively, you can find our new Patreon page at patreon.com. Then search for Resilience Space Unraveled. So, let's get started. Enjoy the show. So, welcome everybody to Resilience Unraveled. And today my guest is Kim Curry. Now, Kim and I am... started chatting 21 minutes ago just you know my normal 30 seconds about uh, the podcast and how it works and 20 uh, 20 and a half minutes ago we started we're still we've just stopped and we thought we better put the microphone on so um hi kim <laughs> nice to see you again <laughs> and nice to see you sir thank you very much yes sir so um kim describe to our audience what it is that you do Okay. Um, Right now, I've become a writer. I spent 33 years in radio broadcasting and uh, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, a pretty serious case. And it took control of my body for a good 12 years. I had a medicine change uh, and it's my condition started to to level off. Uh, At that point, I needed to turn my brain on and do something new. So I began to write. Um, I've I've now got a couple books out. I actually had to hire someone to teach me how to do it, but uh, I'm I'm now a writer. That's what I spend my time doing now. Brilliant. Um, so tell me about tell me. Well, first of all, I, I can spot by your accent that you're not from the fair shores of the United Kingdom. So you're obviously further afield. Tell me where in the world you are. I was born in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, my father is uh, was a retired Navy man. Spent 20 years in the U.S. Navy. And we traveled around the country, but I ended up out here in Colorado. Uh, when I was about uh, seven years old, my dad, uh, his last assignment was to be a Navy recruiter in Pueblo, Colorado. And it's the middle of nowhere, close to water. And I always wondered why. Uh, but he was a recruiter out there. Um, and then, you know, after spending a few years having all the kids in this state come to him uh, to try to enlist and get into the Navy, um, he realized where all the smart kids came from. Uh, and I just found this out in the last five or six years as I was doing research for my book. Mm-hmm. I asked my mother, why did dad bring us to Canyon, which is about 30 miles away from where he was stationed as a recruiter. And my mom said, well, he said that all the smart kids come from Canyon. Mm-hmm. So after recruiting all the boys in Colorado, he said all the smart kids come from Canyon. So he moved us over there. Um, I, he was in, I was in high school. He um, uh, was on the radio as a newsman and got me my first full-time, my first part-time job on the radio. And then uh, I bounced around America. But I think in Colorado, what you hear in my, in my I, is I don't really have an accent. In America, you can hear a Southern accent, a Texas accent, a Maryland accent. They say Balmer instead of Baltimore, Balmer. Yeah. Um, but, I, but in Colorado, I'm just a, I just have a regular, clean uh, but I can do accents. <laughs> I was on the well, radio for many don't, years. I can do don't, accents. Don't tempt me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. No, thank you. <laughs> There's a, yes, no, that's not set up. Um, <laughs> but right now, Richard, I'm, I'm right now in Loveland, Colorado. This is um, right. the northern part of just north of Denver. Uh, there's the Colorado State University is in our city. So we're in, we're, yeah. uh, it's a and beautiful so, part of the world. And so... I mean, a career in radio is yes. is that is that a career? that doesn't sound like work that sounds like a lifetime of fun jolly japes and excitement. Absolutely, I always tell people that never worked a day in my life. Uh, my dad did me a big favor, uh, yeah. actually, and it was an accident. He 
my dad came home one day and said that his boss wanted me to come and babysit for him, which is how I made money as a, as a high school kid. I babysat my parents' friends' kids. Um, but what the boss wanted me to babysit was the Sunday morning God shows because they would record all these services from the churches around town. Right. And on Sunday morning, they played last week's over on the radio mm -hmm. and nobody wanted that job. So he wanted me to come and babysit the God show. And then, you know, I just stumbled into a really successful time in Miami, Florida. Yeah. Um, I got six months after I got my first full-time job in Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, I sent out some air checks, the tapes that we used to audition, uh, because I didn't like my Knoxville. My first full-time job was a disaster. So I wanted to leave, and I just shipped some tapes out. And there's a song by Peter Frampton called Baby, I Love Your Way. Mm. And at the beginning of that song, it starts with applause. And then you hear Peter say, thank you. Well, one night on the radio in Knoxville as a 22-year-old little boy, I started that song and the applause started. And I said, hey, Peter, your zipper's down. And he said, thank you. <laughs> so I put that on my audition tape. And my audition tape ended up at a radio station in Miami, Florida. And the guy who I went to work for at the time, I didn't know, uh, was a radio genius, uh, very well known in the business, but I was a young radio pup. I didn't know anything about really the upper echelon. And he hired me and uh, 33 years later, uh, I was the boss of the radio station and we had the highest ratings in the history of the station for nine years. Wow. It was the most successful radio station. Uh, for, for the group of people that we had, it was the most success the station had had. So it was yeah. a really fun time for me, but it was just a fluke. I just, you know, I, had, I made a joke about Peter Frampton's song. Peter, your zipper's down. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that was the beginning of my career. And, and you said that as if it's luck, but you see, there's an awful lot of work that goes into that. It's like the 10 years of hard labor you put in before you become an overnight sensation, isn't it? And you know, that's... you got to remember back in those days, we were playing records. Yeah. So I, I can, now that you said that, I can imagine how many times I started yeah. it and put it in queue to hear it and go, Hey, yeah. Peter, your zipper's down. Thank you. Yeah. And know exactly where I needed to start it. So it was yeah. hard work. You're right. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. So, so obviously you've had this, Condition, um, this medical condition, MS. Yes, for, for those of us, for those people who don't know much about MS, tell us something about it. Um, multiple sclerosis. Uh, for some reason, lesions appear on your brain, and as you know, different parts of your brain uh, work different parts of your body. So, if a lesion, like in my case, is close to the, where my adrenaline segment is, whatever, every time my adrenaline runs, my body starts to go into seizure. Right. So as we were talking a few minutes ago, my body was in seizure because of what we were talking about. Yeah. But now it's a nice, calm conversation. So the lesions can appear and it, it affects the motion of the hands. Uh, I first started just getting little cramps in my toes. You know, I, I'm, I'm going I'm to preface all this by saying that I was having what they call multiple sclerosis exacerbations for about 50 years before I even realized what was going on. Yes. Um, I can mention one case in particular that kind of is an example. Um, I, I was on the radio in Washington, D.C., and on the radio at night, I had a feature. It was called Bed Check. And at the end of Bed Check, uh, that's where you hear the phrase, come get me, mother, I'm through, because the feature was, was based on people just calling in and saying whatever they wanted to say. Yeah. And then I'd be finished with them, and I'd say, okay, that's the end of the show. Come get me, mother, I'm through. Uh -huh. Well, the segment was designed for young high school kids to call in. But in Washington, D.C., it became a political thing where I'd pick up the phone and I'd hear people because it was during the second Reagan uh, administration, actually mm. during the first going into the second Reagan administration. Mm. So it became political. And then one time I picked up the phone and a gentleman uh, said, hey, it's me, Frank DeFramer. I'm at the White House right now in my office, and the president just walked out. He was listening to bed check. And I thought, ha, 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 that's really funny. Goodbye. And I hung up. I didn't think it was real. I thought it was a joke. But it kept happening. Yes. Hey, I'm over here at the White House. And, and so finally, I picked up the phone and caught him off the air one day. And I said, wait, wait, who are you? What, are you, what is this Frank DeFramer? Well, come to find out Frank DeFramer 
was the actual framer of portraits at the White House. He had his own mm -hmm. office where he did all the work and mm -hmm. he was Frank the Framer. And so when he was saying the president was just listening to you, he really was just listening to me. Oh, wow. So there came a point to where a friend insisted I get a tour of the White House for her grandmother. Yes. So I called Frank DeFramer. He said, come on over. Just tell him Frank DeFramer knows you're coming, that you're Kid Curry. And so I rolled, I go to the White House. I drove around. And this is just after the assassination attempt. So right. there had been changes at the White House to the direction of how to get in, but it, there was nothing that I could recognize. So I right. saw a road that went right up to the side. And so I'm driving up this road. I'm thinking this is where I'm supposed to go. But as I'm getting closer to the door, the side door, Secret Service starts coming up and they're pulling guns. And I slow the car down. And at that point, my right eye went blank. Uh -huh. And then my right shoulder started, I was like, suddenly I started curling up. And when I got out of the car, I just rolled out of the car. And meanwhile, I've got this grandma on my back seat, my yes. friend next to me. And I'm rolling out and they're pulling guns. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm Kid Curry. I'm here for Frank DeFramer. And they're like, oh, Kid Curry. Oh, okay, man. No problem. No problem. Do you need a wheelchair? I'm like, oh, jeez. Wow. Grandma's in the car. I need a wheelchair. So, so that, was like an a that was an exacerbation. I didn't know that stress... Mm -hmm. At that time, and then it happened a variety of times in my life. There was another time when I thought I got stung by bees, but no, it was an exacerbation. So right. around, around um, 2004, right around the time of the tsunami, I was here in Colorado visiting my mother from Miami. I had taken a, a week off and I was here and the tsunami happened. Well, my mother had, she had no idea what the word even meant. So we were watching it intently and we were together the whole time. She cried over it and everything. And then the day I left, she said, there's something wrong with you. There's something wow. going on with you. There, look, your face doesn't look right. You don't look like you're walking right. There's something going on. You got to go to the doctor, which started the three months of testing to right. find out that I had multiple sclerosis. Right. So. And so how does it manifest itself in, in terms of your life? Well, first of all, as I said, I was, I was, my mother noticed that I wasn't walking straight. Well, as I was playing golf one morning, I used to get up early and go play nine holes. I used to live on Don Shula's golf course, the famous football coach. And I got up more, one morning and I, and I went out and I, was, and I swung the golf club and I felt something happen in my lower back. Well, I come to find out now, lesions also appear in the spine. Uh -huh. So I had twisted a lesion and everything just went paralyzed on me almost. So I wow. struggled home and, and that's what got me really going, wait a minute, th this is not ever going to get better. Yeah. So at that point, my legs just never recovered. My toes curled up and uh, it, it, I, I got the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis on a Friday and I went home and my wife, uh, who is a genius, uh, Googled everything she could find back in 2005, Google. And uh, by Monday morning, we had decided that I was going to go in and tell the office I needed to retire. And, and I was done because yeah. it was serious. Something was really going wrong. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I can only tell you that at the time, there were only five drugs available for multiple sclerosis. And there's been more. There's probably 20 now. But at the yeah. time, about 10 years into my plight, my doctor noticed a new drug come on. I had been taking Rebif. He moved me to Copaxone. And then, you know, he, he's, a, he's a scientist. This is my doctor's book. I'm sorry. Optimal Health with Multiple Sclerosis. Um, he's a scientist. And if it's not real, and if he doesn't have scientific proof, he don't talk about it. So he started harassing me. Six months, calling me in my house. Start taking vitamin D. Start taking vitamin D. And apparently, um, <laughs> my wife and, and he got to me, so I started taking high doses of vitamin D, four and five IUs a day. And I, uh, the combination of my medicine change and the vitamin D leveled off my condition. And I, it's almost like I, I feel guilty because <laughs> I, I, I go to meetings. To, well, I do, we do them now on Zoom with meetings with guys over 50 who have MS. And, and I mean, these guys, some of these guys are going down hard, but I've been lucky. My medicine changed if it was the medicine or the vitamins or whatever. And I cannot tell anybody to go do that. Don't start taking yeah, vitamin yeah. D without consulting your doctor. 
Okay. But, but something happened. And then for the last five years, when I became a writer, my doctor immediately, when he saw the level change, he said, okay, now I want you to get on your computer and start doing some brain, some brain yes. games. You need to start rewiring what's going on in your brain. Yeah. I had a MS had affected my voice. Had, had, had I been five years ago, you, you'd be hearing me barely talk and get through my full words. Wow. But now this rewiring thing that I've been doing, I feel like I've, I've rewired because my hands don't shake like they used to. Right. Uh, my voice doesn't do what it used to. So I, and plus I'm a, an extremely positive thinking person. My wife is an international business coach. Um, for example, when this whole pandemic thing happened, the, we in America on March 13th, were told we were going into national lockdown mm. over that weekend, my wife's company, she works with the Keller Williams realty people, and she's a, a, a business coach through them. They spent the entire weekend mapping out what they were going to do on Monday because they knew that they wanted the business community to, to not panic to know that this was going to go on. And here's how we're going to come back. Know that you're going to lose employees. You're going to lose property. But this is going to come back, and you need to be ready and running so we can just get back to work. Mm. Um, so my wife is a very positive, positive thinking person. So the medicine combination, the extra brain work I've been doing, and my positive attitude has, has, has really kind of – tempered what was a disaster for me yes and, and, and my doctor not, my doctor doesn't people, have any answer he doesn't have any answers he just no. he thinks it's that he thinks it's all those things well i mean there's so much science around optimism and yes and the way we think affecting us you know i mean you talked earlier about the adrenaline and the cortisol effects on your body you know when when the lesions are working in your brain i mean there's so much evidence to support that now, you know, um, and vitamin D, of course, and diet and such like. I've got a, a dear friend of mine who has MS and manages all of the symptoms with diet and has never taken a drug. You know, someone just brought that to me in the last two weeks. Yeah. And, and I have, I have find a lot of research and I'd never seen it. So I'm going to go now research it because yeah. this is the second time I've heard of that now in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. And I think, and, and, I, I don't think we've realized what we've done to ourselves over, you know, yeah. four decades of processed, industrialized, sanitized food, really. It's, it's part, of all, part of all the disruption we're feeling now in the world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, when we're very much not, not looking forward to your chlorinated chicken um, invading our country. So, uh. oh, no, I know. <laughs> and my wife and I, you know, it all depends. We just went as I told you, bird boxing this morning, yes, yes. Uh, we, we went and did our, our weekly grocery shopping and we get all dressed up. We have our masks on, we go yeah. in and we see everybody with masks and they tell you exactly which direction to go, you know? So it's, it's just kind of funny. So we did that this morning. We got chicken there's two different kinds we get. And one specific kind looks like it's from a real chicken. Wow. The other stuff is like, wow, those are awfully big little breasts. <laughs> 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 what am I eating here? But, uh, Oh, well, well you've, you, you talked about rejuvenating your brain and beginning the process of writing. And, and, yes. and, and in fact, actually, you've written some books. So tell us a bit about that. Um, you know, when I decided that it was time to, and my doctor, it was really all him, okay? You've got to start doing stuff. So when I decided to start writing, there was a big difference between my radio job, when I could get on the radio and yeah. say whatever I wanted to, however I wanted to say it, and then writing it and putting it down on a piece of paper or on my computer screen. There's a big difference. So I actually went out and hired a writing coach. Uh, Carrie Flanagan is my writing coach, and I still have her. That was about three years ago. And uh, she immediately sent me to books to read because all she knew was some guy found her. And I said, listen, I used to be on the radio, a kind of famous guy. I want to tell my story about getting MS and getting out of the business and what's happened to me since. And she, that's all she heard from me. Then she gave me, she gave me a, a lesson. She said, you need to go read this book called Save the, Save the Cat Strikes Back. Now, what that book did is it turned my writing brain on because it taught me how to stick to the spine of the story, how you can tell any story and mm. go off onto any, any, anything you want to talk about, but you've got to weave it back to the spine of the story. What was it? What so, was it called again, Kit? It's called Save the Cat Strikes Back. Save the... 
Come. Cat strikes back. Yes, sir. You see, I like to do real. This is the Absolutely. sound of an old man doing Google. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <That's> a, <laughs> sorry, carry on. No, you know what? I couldn't do two screens. <laughs> so I, I stay where I'm at. I'd love to be able to do the same, but I can't. Blake Snyder. Yes, Blake Snyder. That's him. And um, so she made me study the book uh, and then would take what I'd written. Uh, and it took about six months of me to sit down and finally pound this thing out. No, actually six months of research and then six months of pounding it out. I was telling my personal story, but I needed to go back and say, well, if I'm going to talk about, you know, Gene Simmons of Kiss or, you know, Casey of the Sunshine Band or a concert I did with Ricky Martin, I need to be able to have all the facts because I don't want anybody coming back to me. Uh, and telling me I made stuff up. So I researched for six months and then I wrote for six months and she sent back everything. She, I remember the red pencil that your teacher used to give you when you wrote stuff mm. and would correct it and say, this is wrong. This, well, I'd get that every week. Wow. And so for six months, I pounded it out and, and finally it, it came to fruition and I uh, self-published, but uh, I got it out and it's done pretty well. And, and people have enjoyed the story because I've been on the radio in, in Miami for 25 years. Uh, and I had the most success the last nine years of my career there, and it really kind of bumped up my career. But I'd also been in in Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, Pueblo, Colorado, um, San Antonio, Texas, uh, Washington, D.C., and Baltimore, Maryland. So I'd been around the country. So this book came out and, and a few markets of people that had been fans of me and my radio stations. And, and of course, the title is? Come Get Me, Mother. I'm Through. Why right, good. And of course, and, and then, and, you know, you look on Amazon and, you know, you know what Amazon's like, it's full of people that spend their professional lives telling, telling people it's everything that you see is horrible. But you've got five, st I mean, all your reviews are five stars. So, you know, that's, that's a very good, um, that's a people very good People have been thing. very kind. It was surprising to me. First of all, you know, you tell a story of your life and I didn't, the real brunt of the story is my amazing wife, how my wife really has made me want for nothing in this met in this mission i've got called ms um you know i have the best wheelchair i have you know i have the best crutches when i need them i mean i have a complete handicap uh, designed kitchen that my wife we've done two of those now um, my wife has hand controls in my car so i can move and go out and do shopping and things so um, it's really an ode to my wife when you get to the end of the story and you see the things that she's done for me, then it's, that's really why I'm here. Yes. Because, um, you know, caregivers, people that care about you when a chronic disease uh, hits can sometimes go the other way. Yes. And uh, my wife has not stepped back a, an inch. And, um, and, and like I said, she is not only my favorite, but she's a business coach internationally. And she has fans all around the world. People love Kim, you. Kim, you're, I can tell you've got a career as an agent coming up. So you're, you're <laughs> bigging her up. But today is about you. So, so we've got two books to look forward to. And how and 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 if people want to know more about you, read your blog and such like. Uh, how will they get? How will they find you? Um, it's very simple. I've I, I've got a web page, krcurry.com. Um, and there you'll see the "Come Get Me, Mother, I'm Through" book. And I've done another book, a, a book that is called "The Death of Fairness." Mm right here, The Death of Fairness. Um, that book is, is a short story, but it's a story that my father and I lived as 30 years after he got me the job. Yeah. Um, when, when my dad and I were there together when I was 17, the radio station was run by everybody in town. I mean, everybody knew everybody, and the guy who did middays was the guy that did the things at the high school, and the guy that did afternoons was the guy who was the... Uh, grand marshal of the, all the parades. And uh, so we worked together as a family. And then um, Ronald Reagan rescinded the Fairness Doctrine. And at that point, everything changed in my hometown. The corporation, the guys who were owning the radio station, fired all the locals and then put on these syndication programs that were all very, very right-leaning. Yeah. And remember, when Reagan rescinded the Fairness Doctrine, you effectively took out the second half of the conversation, the Fairness Doctrine in America was the law that, had, that was with the Federal Communications Commission that said that uh, radio stations needed to provide equal time for contrasting yes. points of view, yes. which, you know, 
was time consuming and it cost corporations money. So they went to Reagan and complained and Reagan said, well, we'll just eliminate the fairness doctrine yeah. and just say that it's contrary to the rights that are given through the first amendment, the right of free speech. People should have the right to say whatever they want. Well, I agree with they should have the right to say whatever they want, but when you're lying, what the fairness doctrine did was it gave people the authority to go back and, for example, mm. the presidents from Kenya, and then you would have for 15 minutes, and then you'd have the same amount of time with someone saying, no, here's his birth certificate, so that's a lie. So when you take out the fairness doctrine, what you've effectively done is you've left the presidents from Kenya all up without debate, so effectively making lies legal. So and so, that's, so that's and so that's really the reason why the American media is is actually an opinionated branch of its a mouthpiece almost of the political views of either the owners or the funders or the institutions that support it. That's why it happened. And 30 years later, or 40, no, 30 years later, you can see that uh, we have real division in this country. And I guarantee you that if Ronald Reagan saw what he'd done, because mm. remember, all we're looking for is equal time for contrasting points of view. When you lie, I have, want to have the right to say, no, he's lying. Yes. And then you come in with facts. You have to come yes. with facts to debate. prove that. Debate. Yeah, absolutely. It's open I mean, it debate. And it's, and it's that thing, isn't it, about, you know, le we have to learn to debate and come to compromise or, uh, you know, change the nuance of our views. Uh, Kim, you and I could talk all day, all night, through the yes. night, and out the other end again. And I need to be courteous to your time because I'm looking at the time and yes, sir. Swiss on. So thank you so much for spending time to us today. It's your books are Come Get Me Mother I'm Through It. And a really interest. I'm going to buy The Death of Fairness immediately because um, I think as soon as it comes out, I'm fascinated in the history of radio and media. Thank you very much. Uh, krcurry.com. Com, I think was the website you said, krcurry.com, yes, like the Indian food. You've been a joy to talk to. Thank you so much for pleasure. spending time with us today. Thank you, sir. You take care. Hi, everybody. I hope you found that episode useful and interesting. Feedback is always welcomed. And if you're in the mood to subscribe to us or even leave a comment on iTunes or Stitcher, that would be amazing. If you want to suggest ideas or even people you would like me to interview, then reach out to us at qedod.com forward slash contact. As I said earlier, you can go to qedod.com forward slash podcast for show notes or follow the links. And you can go to qedod.com forward slash extras to access offers, tools and resources, including free articles and ebooks. For those of you that would be interested in supporting our work and contributing more proactively, you can find our new Patreon page at patreon.com, then search for Resilience Unraveled. I look forward to being in your ear next time around. Take care.